test, test. Good morning, and welcome to the house of the Lord, where the people of God come together and to worship him in spirit and in truth. One of the lessons that we have learned in our Bible study in the midweek is the answer to the first question, what is the ends of man? Or what is our purpose? And does any one of the students of that class care to answer that question? Anyone? Well, I guess they're all hiding. <laughs> well, it is to glorify God and to have pleasure in him, enjoy him, and to love him. And so as people of God, we are to glorify the Lord in this worship experience. And part of that is, is the reading of the scriptures and how we learn from them, because that pleases God, because he has given us his word. So this morning, I welcome you all, and I want to welcome those who are on Zoom this morning and are over there. So yes, as we do, we miss you. And uh, if you couldn't be here with us because you were not feeling well, we will pray for you later. And uh, But those of you who are homebound, we welcome you. And those of you who are away, we welcome all of you this morning. As uh, some announcements, next uh, Sunday after the worship service, we will be having a fellowship meal. And uh, at the conclusion of the service, so there should be a, a sheet with uh, your signing up, not necessarily by name, but by number of, of those of you who will be coming to that so that we have, can have a tally so we can prepare the meals. Now, the choice of meals, hmm, let's see here. Hmm, I got to I have to select before you do because I don't want it running out. So, so, but anyway, it's a ham and broccoli quiche or vegetable quiche. Nice choices. Plus desserts, I believe, and drinks, right? And salad. And salad. Und salad. Yeah. So that's uh, very good. Um, Bible study will continue on Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and uh, you can come. If you haven't started, you're, you're welcome to come. Please uh, do so. Any other announcements that I... Yes, Brian. Uh, I'll make my pitch again like I did last week. <sighs> yes. Uh, Bay Corral, the course that we sing in. Neil Auditorium on the first Sunday of April, April 7th. Tony Bennett tribute song at 4 o'clock on Sunday, and I have tickets. Okay. $15 All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mary? Tomorrow we have our last spiritual growth book study. Okay. At the last spiritual growth study book class tomorrow. The last one. And that, what time is that? 1 to 2.30. 1 to 2.30. All right. So there. Okay. Any other announcements? There is one more. One more. And I thought there was, I saw a cake. On this, yes, I saw a cake on, and and uh, it's disappeared already. So the choir got a hold of it. Kathy, it's Kathy's birthday, right? Yep, and there's some more there is some more. It's okay, cut. it's already cut. So, so uh, let's uh, let's have a. Happy birthday to you. All right. Congratulations. God bless you, Kathy. Now, what, what was that? Double digits. Double digits uh, 29. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> All right. Let us now begin our worship as forgiven people. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Let us stand and let us greet each other in the name of the Lord.
I just kind of like the hand and the next one to stand up. That's why I like this. But I suppose I can do that. These are pretty good. I just have to pull them down. That would be cool at six. Oh, wow, they're already enjoying it. One or two. Jones, do you ever know, do you ever know, um, I mean, each or breakfast casseroles or any accessories? Okay, and we're bringing them up 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 and we're bringing them up. If you can't, that's okay. I can do it. Don't worry. I've got enough. We've got enough on the second half. So don't worry. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
This morning, as we have come assembling to learn, to hear from you, Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, our minds, that we may receive you with gladness and joy. Help us, Lord, also to be reminded that who we are as a broken people, needing your help constantly. And may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our souls always please you, our rock and our redeemer. In Christ's name, we ask and pray, amen and amen. Our opening hymn of celebration is all glory, laud, and honor. In number 300, please stand and join us. Often that we feel great remorse when we say something to another and immediately we regret it. And then upon that response and reaction, we don't even have the courage to admit it to that person. And we wait and wait and wait. The Lord is always with us, and he always sees us, and he knows our very hearts, even before we act or do or even think of something. So we have an opportunity to confess our sins post that action from us. And so this morning, I invite you to join with me, with me, to confess before the Lord our sins. Let us pray. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long will humanity turn your glory into shame? How long will your people love delusions and seek false gods? In my anger I have sinned. Though you continue to search my heart for love, could forgive me, O Lord, and help me to follow your teaching and live a life that is pleasing to you, so that your face may once again shine upon me. Amen. Amen. 
hear the words of pardon. Friends, forgiveness comes from God, who does not count our sins against us. For God has reconciled us through Christ and entrusts to us the message of reconciliation. Believe the gospel. In Christ Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. And together now we will share in our confession of faith. Christians, what do you believe? In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles. And this morning I will be reading from the second epistle from the Apostle Paul to his son in faith, Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter one and verse, I am going to begin from verse five this morning. Paul wrote this. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and, a, and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord. In the ancient Mediterranean world, a number of civilizations use a method of burial. And they're found in what we call today catacombs. Have any of you seen the catacombs near Rome? Anyone? Oh, okay, right behind me. As I recall, it was dark and dank in some places and a little musty. And some might say, 
even uh, the smell of death. But according to the Encyclopedia of Britannica, some truths about the catacombs have to be shared. I always thought, or at least Hollywood would tell me that the catacombs were used for the Christians to hide from uh, persecution by the Romans. At least that's what it looked like in, in, from Hollywood's perspective. But the truth is that those spaces were not used to hide. They may have been used to run through to escape the persecutors from one end, from the beginning to the end, outside of Rome, but not to stay, nor to stay and worship as those who were hiding from the Roman persecutors because maybe they were afraid to worship outdoors or in someone's home, and the Romans would find out during times of great persecution, and they would run to the catacombs to worship, but they couldn't do that because their spaces were too small. And in those later times, there were many, many Christians that were there. Around 1990, my wife and my daughter and a number of American servicemen and their families went to visit the catacombs. And it was indeed impressive, very impressive. Couldn't imagine those workers who were digging and chiseling into that stone many feet below the surface. And so the history of the catacombs does not include that they were a place for Christian worship or hiding, but maybe a Christian fleeing, but certainly for Christian burial. That we know for sure. Now, in the second epistle to Timothy, Paul was in chains in Rome. He had traveled around the Mediterranean Sea preaching the gospel at least three times, three trips around the sea. Some say he went as far as Spain. We're not so sure. We know for sure that he landed in Rome itself as a prisoner for his faith. And from there he wrote this last epistle to Timothy. Some say it was the very last epistle that he was ever to write before his execution. And there he was writing in order to encourage Timothy, a younger man, maybe not so young as some would think. Maybe he, he was not certainly a teenager, but he was old enough to be in charge or as a pastor of a church. And as oftentimes as pastors, we struggle. We struggle oftentimes. Sometimes pastors are held in very high esteem, so much so when they fall, they wreck the community and the church. So we ought not to hold so high that these beings called pastors are perfect. No way, and of course you know that to be true. You remember in the early 80s or mid 80s when those great television preachers would be out there. Yes, right? <laughs> was it the man that had all the makeup on the face? Oh, no, 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 it was not the man. Well, there would be stomping and yelling at the people not to do certain things but then turn around and do the very same things and get caught. Brought shame to the church. Brought shame to the church. One of the wonderful things about being a Presbyterian pastor is this. Because in one of the areas, there are two areas that pastors fall. 
One we know, sexual immorality, unfortunately. But the other is greed. And one of the wonderful things about Presbyterian pastors is that we are what we call the teaching elders of the church. You have the ruling elders that take care of the properties and the policies of managing the church, and then you have the teaching elders, the pastor, the professors, or whatever. And one of the things that we're not allowed to do as a teaching elder is to sign checks. Thank God. <laughs> Thank you, ruling elders, that you have that power, and I don't. Because that is indeed an area of great temptation. Well, this, is not what, this was not, or at least these two areas were not of concern for the apostle Paul in the life of Timothy. He was struggling in another area. Paul writes to him and he reminds him quickly of his heritage, his legacy. He names two very important people in his life. Lois, his grandmother, and Eunice, his mother. Ladies, let me tell you, you have a great responsibility. Not to exclude the men, you do also. Grandfathers, great-grandfathers, but great-grandmothers, grandmothers, and mothers have great responsibility for the lives, the spiritual lives of your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Just because we arrive at a certain age in life does not mean that we're to stop. The title of my message today is Into the Catacombs. I already dismissed the idea that it was a place of worship or of hiding, but it was a burial place. And you cannot bury, nor can you stop the idea of praying and supporting your very own. You still carry that grave responsibility. There is no retirement for that at all. And you, you know that. I'm not telling you anything new. You know it and you feel it in your hearts that your children, your legacy, holds a great deal of dearness in your hearts. So Paul was telling Timothy that you have two very important special ladies in your life that are still praying for you. Or if grandmother had gone and gone with the Lord already, still the legacy, the memory of that, and the power of prayer. For you see, it helped them and led him in his spiritual growth and development. Now, I was born and raised in New York City. And in our neighborhood, we had this great church building called St. Ansem's. And I had the privilege of... Uh, learning how to be an altar boy. Then I grew and became a young man and didn't go too far to college. And as a freshman, oh dear, I, freshman year, I don't, I, I think they should not have any classes <laughs> because it's a waste of time and waste of money. They should just go ahead and give them 50 bucks or $100 and say, go over to that bar and spend your first year in the bar. Because that's what it is. 
as uh, some say, it's a drink fest. <laughs> but I remember one occasion coming back home to the Bronx on the subway, all the way from Greenwich Village, because that's where my, my college was, Baruch College, or CCNY, right there on 14th Street, the northern part, northernmost part of the Greenwich, of the village. And so we hung out in the village. And so I got home one night, about three, tender age of 18 and a half. Now in New York, it was legal to drink. We didn't have to be 21. Took the elevator up to the eighth floor. As quietly as I could in my stupor, put the key in the door opened it up. I was still living at home. Steel door. Quietly closed it. Put that bar. Some of you know what I'm talking about. That big bar against the door. And clicked it quietly as I could. And I started walking towards my bedroom. But I had to go past the living room. I turned to the left, and there in the shadows, silhouetted against the front windows and the street lights, was my dear mother praying, praying for me. I'll never forget that image, even in the midst of my stupor, my drunkenness. It made an impact, it made a difference. That's probably what the difference in Timothy's life, having two ladies. This should be a Mother's Day sermon, right? <laughs> Could be, right? But the truth is, it's good for every Sunday. Powerful. Who said that the Bible is irrelevant? It's as good today as it was then. Here's the proof. Just in that simple verse about Lois and Eunice. Powerful. Has an impact. And your witness is, must be manifested in such a manner. Now, Paul continued to instruct Timothy. Okay, you have a heritage. You have a legacy. Now, let's not be ashamed of what you possess. Fan the fire of your faith. The gift that God has given you. And God has given each one of us a gift. As a believer in Christ Jesus, he has already empowered you regardless of your stature. He's gifted you. You are an important cog in the machinery called the kingdom of God. It is not while we're walking and breathing on this earth, we are not to bury the gift that God has given to us. Not to go into the catacombs yet. You're still here. I see you. You cannot hide from me, especially from the Lord. What has God given you? What is your purpose? Timothy had a purpose. And his purpose was to serve the local congregation. 
Not to run from what was to come. You had a message to deliver, and it was the gospel, the gospel of Christ. And here's a beautiful part of the gospel of Christ that he said, Paul said, who saved us and called us to a holy, holy calling, not because of our works. In other words, we didn't earn our way into his kingdom, he, but because of his own purpose and grace, he, he saved you but he saved you from the clutches of the evil one for a purpose, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began and which now, now is now, has been manifested through the appearing of the Savior, our Savior Christ Jesus. And these beautiful words as a reminder as believers in Christ that you have been granted a wonderful privilege, and is this. Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He has abolished death. Now, how do we consider that? How many times have we sat at someone's bedside, a family member, and held their hands to their very last breath? And wondered what it would be like for us. As someone held our hands, to the very last breath. For the non-Christian, it's certainly something to dread, to feel a great deal of fear and trepidation. But not so for the Christian. Though our bodies will pass away, but our lives will continue into eternity. Yesterday, as I was thinking about these words, the thought came back to me as one day I was driving my car down the interstate, not to mention what is going around me and such. But have you considered what it's like as your soul lives within your body? I thought, I don't know if this is a good analogy or metaphor, but consider this. As you sit behind your wheel and you're looking out your windshield, could that not be a representation of your soul sitting in the front seat, looking out the windshield of your eyes? And you have possessed this car called your body all your life. You bought it, and you kept it, you paid for it, you insured it. Sometimes you nicked it, you had some fender benders, but still you kept it. But then came time to turn the key off and to dump it. What about that driver? Does that driver go to the junkyard or does the driver step out of his car or her car? I thought about that. Is that the way our spirits stand at death? We just open that door and we step out. We're still seeing. We're still existing. Nothing has transpired other than we have dumped that old car. <clears throat> and the scriptures promise us a new and perfect car. 
incorruptible, imperishable. A car so good, as I told my wife, <clears throat> we're driving Yugos, and when we arrive in heaven, he will give us those Ferraris. <laughs> huh? That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, not in those words. But could be worse. <laughs> Nothing worse than a Yugo, right? Oof, that was a rough car. I think it was three cylinders or two cylinders. What I'm saying is that death, and some have described it in some of these stories we hear, that death seems like just a path, a, a, an instantaneous, you don't even feel it because you're still living. Though these bodies perish. Again, I don't want to talk about what will happen to those who are not a part of the family of God. Dear me. But this is the gospel that Timothy was to preach and what we are to hear and to, be, to listen to, the truth of the gospel. It is your living hope to eternal life. Why fear? Why be afraid? God has given you life. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. Don't be ashamed of this message. Why should you fear when someone attacks you for your faith, when you can reply with them, where is your hope, buddy? What's going to happen when you take your final breath? I know in whom I believe, who's given me life. I have no fear. No need to be ashamed. No need at all. Let that light shine forth so that others will ask you, what is that hope that you hold? Why is it? that even in the worst of times, you still have a wonderful hope in your life. Bear it, show it, don't be ashamed of it. God has given you that life. It's no wonder that Paul, even when he knew that he was gonna lose his head he was not going to be crucified, not like Peter, nor like the Lord. Why? Because he was a Roman citizen. And Roman citizens, if they were to be executed, was by, at the end of a blade. He knew it. It was coming. He was judged. But when you read his words, you can feel that sense of joy and wonder and hope. And he passes that on to the next generation of preachers in this letter. So he goes on to say, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you, through the laying on of my hands. This idea of laying of hands is a very important gesture in the life of the body of Christ. And later on in our service, that is going to be displayed. Not in the ordination of someone coming into ministry, but as a sign showing forth the power of prayer and the promise of God blessing and healing even. Paul says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. He tells us also in Romans chapter eight about this no need to have this fear. 
verse 15, 8 and 15. For, God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba. Aramaic, the Father. The privilege of calling God Abba. You listen to young Hebrew children they say, Abba, or oh, Ima. Beautiful, They're beautiful, tender words. That's the relationship you have with the Father. That you have that personal name that you can apply to him. You don't have the fear. You don't need to have that fear of being an est estranged from him. Oh, hallowed God. <laughs> you bow and you grovel. No. You have a special privilege before the master, before the father. A tenderness, a tender relationship. as a child who has just fallen off a bicycle and scraped their knee and yells out, Mom or Dad. And Mom and Dad come running to pick up that child who has scraped their knees. That's the relationship you and I have with that. He who is there for us. And Paul reminds us that. No need to have fear because fear comes from Satan. As in the Lord's Prayer, keep us from the evil. We say evil, but it really means the evil one who, who is Satan. Because he wants to bring fear into your hearts, doubt about what the word represents and what God, and even say to you, God is a liar. When in fact, he is the king of liars. So do not fear, he tells Timothy, have trust in the power of God. And then thirdly, he tells Timothy this, to follow, to hold fast, and to share. He says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. In other words, I taught you the gospel. I reaffirmed the Old Testament. Believe and trust. But Paul here is ordering him, commanding him, not suggesting, follow the sound patterns, the pattern of the sound words, which is the word of God. My friends, there is nothing more perfect than the word of God. There's no other book, no other teaching, more sound, more relevant to our lives today in this time and age than the word of God. You're feeling low? Turn to the word of God. Things are not going well? Turn to the word of God. You're feeling great? Turn to the word of God. There's no other source that is so inspirational and inspired by God himself. These are the words of God. I can't conceive of that. What? God himself? Right here. Oh, I need a vision of God. Come and peer, the angel of God, come and show me, talk to me, just tell me. Have you read your Bible lately? Here it is, his very words to us, his instructions, but his salvation and his beautiful and his beauty. Follow the word, the pattern of the sound teaching. 
Paul tells them, be on guard of what the gift has been given to you. Be aware. Be vigilant. Scope it out. Watch your back that the enemy won't take away that faith that you have. Be aware constantly. What is the expression? 24-7? That's what you got to do because the enemy wants to take it away from you. And then finally he says to him, share, another command, share in suffering. Oh, that's the part I didn't want to bring today. No pastor wants to give you bad news. It's the way it is. We want to always leave you smiling. And when I go back there, you pat me on the back. Good job, pastor. <laughs> but share in the suffering. Be ready to be accosted. Maybe you're not in the way that they experienced in the time of Rome. But you know what I'm talking about. We're being mocked. We're being chided. We're being embarrassed. We're being told that you're old fashioned. What's the need of coming to church anymore? There is no God. Jesus, some say, didn't even exist. Though serious historians will tell you that <laughs> He did indeed. Yes, there might be reason to be ashamed of our faith, to hide our faith, to be in a very super minority. But Paul is telling Timothy, continue to share your witness in your faith. If someone asks you, why is it that you have such an upbeat manner? Why is it that you seem to have hope in your life? Why is it that you have this inner joy? Why is that, Grandma, Granddad? Tell me, because what I'm hearing in school is something totally opposite. Is it true that the Lord is real? Let us pray. Lord, we need not be ashamed of our faith. We need not bury our faith in a catacomb of life, but we are to reveal it. We are to stand upon it, though we will suffer, but your power and your love, where we can call you Abba Father, will always remain, protecting us, maybe not fully in this life as we would like, but you are protecting us for eternal life. <laughs> that is the good news. And let us share that good news, especially with our children, our sons and daughters, our grandsons and our granddaughters and our great grandsons and our great granddaughters. And when they ask us about what is it that we hold dear in our hearts, we will say, we hold you dear in our hearts enough that we can share the good news of Jesus Christ. He will save your soul and will give you life, real life. Thank you, Lord, for you have given us so much to hold on to. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our God has always seen to the needs of his people. And this morning, I will invite you now as we continue to share in worship that 
part of our worship experience is also in the giving of ourselves to him, whether it's our time, our talent, and our treasure, of course. So I will ask for some volunteers to come and, and take the offering plates. And I have a couple of volunteers. <laughs> okay, I got one. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. All right, a man in orange. Okay, come on. <laughs> God bless. Blessed Lord, you have given us so much, especially the greatest of all gifts, your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to return a portion of these blessings to you, that they may be used to help those with greater, much greater needs than ourselves. May this church be blessed to continue its great work in Palmetto to make a difference in so many lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please, please be seated. I have, I have uh, known that people love to pray, but especially here, to pray and to share, share and pray with each other. So I, I in order to, if you have not noticed, in the last few weeks, I'm a bit disorganized. So let me gather myself, and then and I'm going to start back here first. Like, how's that? Up here. Then I'm going to work my way back, and then I'll work my way back forward. How's that? It's like, thank you. <laughs> so, I Debbie. I have a couple of prayer requests. The first one is for my daughter. Tomorrow morning, she will be having a back procedure done. Hopefully, will help eliminate the pain she's been having in her lower back. The second thing is, a um, very dear friend of ours, Tracy Thompson, who's been here with Carrie many times, um, she had to have a procedure for being an AFib. The first time, it did not work. She ended up going into the hospital where they did an ablation, and that did not work. So now she has to wait three more months before she can have the next ablation or a procedure done. So her heart rate is excessively high, and she covets any and all prayers to try to keep her calm 
pooling collective during the next three months, hoping that the next procedure will work. Okay, let's remember Tracy. Joan? I have joys that our two sons uh, came and visited for almost a week, and my sister was out of the Sister, yes. And also the joy of having Mary Lou back. Oh. Hey, Mary Lou, welcome back. Yay. You were hiding. I didn't see you. Okay. All right. Mary Lou's back. Okay. Brian? Uh, we had a wonderful celebration of life for our friend Mary Ann Jensen uh, yesterday. She was a, a retired nurse and worked for different things, and, and they had a mass for her at St. Joe's yesterday. Same. And uh, it was a wonderful thing. And the family is now recovering from that uh, loss. Okay. All right. Okay. And those of you on Zoom, we want to remember you in our prayers. Karen? Um, my friend Sandy, the living thing, had the one woman. She is now unresponsive. I talked to the hospice nurse last night, and she probably passed away. Okay, so she, she's in her final hours. Okay, Sandy, your friend. Okay, Jeff? Joan's sister, Ann, is visiting from Jacksonville, and we want to welcome her to our church. Anna yes. Her Ooh. <laughs> That's a Joan's sister. All right, good. I love visitors. Yes. My daughter Carla's in the hospital. And Carla. Okay. All right. Is she here locally? No? Okay. All right. Okay. Cindy? Thanks, God. Yes, of course. Okay. I have three. One, my uh, brother-in-law had gallbladder surgery yesterday, and while they were in, they saw a bad spot on his liver, so they took a biopsy, so he may have to have additional surgery. Um, a good friend here in town, Carrie, has injured his hip at work very severely, and unfortunately, workers' comp is fighting him on it. So until that's resolved, he's just sort of trying to get around. Okay. And then finally, Rhonda, a good friend of ours, um, her son's battling uh, colon cancer, and so it's her daughter-in-law, wife of her other son, is in hospice, and the, uh, the morphine... Uh, level is being raised. And that's a daughter-in-law? That's, a, or daughter, that's a Rhonda's uh, daughter-in-law. Yes. Okay. So. Hospice. Okay. Thank you. For a thanks for the birth of great-granddaughter Zoe, born two months early, but is thriving. Great-granddaughter. Soli? Zoe. Oh, Zoe. Zoe, which you know what it means, right? No. You don't. No. How many know the word, the name Zoe? S Z O E. What does it mean? You know? It means. It means life. 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 That's what it means. It means life. In the Greek, yes, yes. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for the prayers, and I'm not, I am not well, but I'm getting better. You're getting better, Mary Lou. Good having you here. Back. Good yes, amen, amen, amen. Our friend Sherry has had her uh, bone marrow transplant, and she got sent home yesterday, but we need healing prayers. Okay. Yes. That's correct. Darla? Darla. Okay. Got an ongoing case. 
ليس بوقت من زمان يا زلمة سوس كان اون اند اون اند شي از تراين تو ورك اند ذي جست موف ذير اتس هارد يس ذات نومونيا ووكينج نومونيا از فيري ديفيكال اوكي وي غونا براي فور ذيس نيدز براين اي سي يور هاند لايك ذير وات Oh. Okay. All right. After I we pray for these needs, and I'm going to make a special call for those who have even more special needs. Karen, it's okay. two nights ago to Tampa. And I would just like all best wishes and prayers to be with her on her 21-year-old endeavor of life. Wow, 21-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> She's moved to Tampa? Yes. Okay, yes, yes, big prayers. Yes, I agree. So, all right. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for allowing us this time together. and especially to bring before the throne of grace the needs of so many who have been noted. For Tamara, who will also, we will engage and bless here in a little while. We want to remember Tracy, who is awaiting uh, another procedure in her life. We want to thank you for the sons of Joan and Jeff, the two sons who have come and spent time with them, her sister who is visiting. We thank you for Mary Lou who has come back and to be with us after her treatments. We pray for the family of Mary Ann Jensen, who her life was celebrated recently We want to pray for Karen's friend, Sandy. We want to again pray for Carla, who is in the hospital. We want to remember that these good folk that need your help, for Carrie, for Gal, for Rhonda, and a son who has cancer, daughter-in-law is in the hospital. We want to pray for Zoe. That means life. We want to pray for Sherry, who just recently received a bone marrow transplant. For Darla, who in North Carolina has returned to work, but still has this walking pneumonia, help her. We want to remember those folk in the Midwest who's experiencing some violent weather, and also the folk who live under the threat and are living in the midst of war itself. To Ukraine and the Middle East, God help them all. We want to thank you and we pray for this granddaughter who is now living in Tampa, and for all the other needs among us. Hear the prayers of your saints today, and we thank you. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. And now, I'd like to invite those with very, very special needs, and especially want to call forward Tamara, and anyone else that needs a special prayer. And I'd like to invite any of our elders to come and join us uh, that is able to come and to lay hands. Uh, the Apostle Paul laid hands on the, those he anointed to serve, but also for the sick. And if you're an elder, active or inactive, and you can come, you can well, let us pray. Uh, Karen? Who else needs a special prayer this morning? <coughs> Mary, Lou. 
Mary Lou, would you like to? Yes, let's get a chair. Do we have chairs and stuff? Oh, you can stand, okay. <laughs> Saints of God, this is important. I, this, uh, this is a, a, a manifestation of the trust we have in God. God knows how to treat every person. And our prayers may not be answered how we think best. But who knows best, right? Not, not just that television show. What do we say? Father knows best. He knows best how to treat. And so, with confidence, allow the Lord to do the work. Let us pray. Father, in the name of the Lord, you have given us the authority to pray for one another and to show our love for each other. You have commanded us to pray for the sick and for those who need you desperately. <clears throat> In the name of the Lord Christ, we ask for that you bless and encourage Tamara as she faces the doctor tomorrow and in the following weeks, help her in her recovery, but Lord, help her overall with her life. Bring healing, bring blessing. In the same way, Lord, you pray, we pray for Karen, who has been struggling for months now with this cough. Lord, bring healing according to your purpose. Let your work, let your power demonstrate <coughs> what is best. And yes, Lord, there are lessons in life and we need to listen to you. May we, as people of God, always have our hearts open to you. Thank you, Lord, for these saints, these elders, these leaders of the church, who are willing to step forward and to pray for the people of God. In Christ's name, and let us pray together as you have taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much, elders, and God bless you. Thank you. Demonstration of a praying church. And so... Don't ever be, let people accuse that Presbyterians don't know how to pray. Amen. Well, we have a closing hymn, number 527, I Know Whom I Have Believed. How many verses are in that? Four, one, two, and four. Let's just sing three verses, one, two and four. Please stand.
us share in the benediction. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a purpose in our being there. Christ who dwells within us has something he wants to do through us where we are. Believe this and go in the joy of God's power and love and grace. Don't forget to sign up for the fellowship meal.